You're quite the sympathist, he said. There are any number of opportunities out there for a person as skilled as yourself. I spread a bit of strawberry across a piece of cheese and toast, then put it into my mouth to give myself time to think. Was Dahl implying he wanted me to focus more on my study of sympathy? Was he implying he wanted to sponsor me to Elthe? Elodine had sponsored my elevation to Rayla, but I knew these things changed. Masters occasionally fought over particularly promising students. Mola, for example, had been a scriv before Arwil stole her away into Medica. I do enjoy my study of sympathy quite a bit, I said carefully. That's abundantly clear, Dahl said with a smile. Some of your classmates wish you enjoyed it a little less. I can assure you of that. He ate another piece of cheese, then continued. That said, it is possible to overdo it. Didn't Tegum say too much study harms the student? Ertram the wiser, actually, I said. It had been in one of the books Master Lauren had set aside for Raylar to study this term. It's true at any rate, he said. You might want to consider taking a term off to relax a bit. Travel a little, get some sun. He took another drink. It's not good to see one of the Ademaru without a tan. I didn't know what to say to that. The thought of taking a holiday from the university had never occurred to me. Where would I possibly go? The host arrived with plates of fish, steaming and smelling of lemon and butter. For a while, both of us concentrated on our food. I was glad for an excuse not to talk. Why would Dahl compliment me on my studies, then encourage me to leave? After a while, Elksa Dahl gave a contented sigh and pushed back his plate. Let me tell you a little story, he said. A story I like to call the ignorant edema. I looked up at that, slowly chewing my mouthful of fish. I kept my expression carefully composed. He arched an eyebrow, as if waiting to see if I had anything to say. When I didn't, he continued. Once there was a learned arcanist. He knew all of sympathy and sigildry and alchemy. He had ten dozen names tucked neatly into his head, spoke eight languages, and had exemplary penmanship. Really, the only thing that kept him from being a master was poor timing and a certain lack of social grace. Dahl took a sip of wine. So this fellow went chasing the wind for a while, hoping to find his fortune out in the wide world. And while he was on the road to Tinue, he came to a lake he needed to cross. Dahl smiled broadly. Luckily, there was an Edema boatman who offered to ferry him to the other side. The Arcanist, seeing the trip would take several hours, tried to start a conversation. What do you think, he asked the boatman, about Tecum's theory of energy as an elemental substance rather than a material property? The boatman replied he'd never thought on it at all. What's more, he had no plans to. Surely your education included Tecum's theophany? The Arcanist asked. I never had what you might call an education, your honor, the boatman said, and I wouldn't know this Tecum of yours if he showed up selling needles to my wife. Curious, the Arcanist asked a few questions and the Edema admitted he didn't know who Feltemi Race was, or what a gearwind did. The Arcanist continued for a long hour, first out of curiosity, then with dismay. The final straw came when he discovered the boatman couldn't even read or write. Really, sir, the Arcanist said, appalled. It is every man's job to improve himself. A man without the benefits of education is hardly more than an animal. Dahl grinned. Well, as you can guess, the conversation didn't go very far after that. They rode for the next hour in a tense silence, but just as the far shore was coming into sight, a storm blew up. Waves started to lash the little boat, making the timbers creak and groan. The Edema took a hard look at the clouds and said, It'll be true, bad in five minutes. Then somewhat worse afore it clears. 
This boat of mine won't hold together through it all. We're going to have to swim the last little bit. And with this, the ferryman takes off his shirt and begins to tie it around his waist. But I don't know how to swim, says the arcanist. Dahl drank off the last of his wine, turned the cup upside down, and set it firmly on the tabletop. There was a moment of expectant silence as he watched me, a vaguely self-satisfied expression on his face. Not a bad story, I admitted. The ruse accent was a little over the top. Dahl bent at the waist in a quick mocking bow. I will take it under consideration, he said, then raised one finger and gave me a conspiratorial look. Not only is my story designed to delight and entertain, but there is a kernel of truth hidden within, where only the cleverest student might find it. His expression turned mysterious. All the truth in the world is held in stories, you know. Later that evening, I related the encounter to my friends while playing cards at Anchors. He's giving you a hint, big wits, Manit said irritably. The cards had been against us all night, and we were five hands behind. You just refused to hear it. He's hinting I should leave off studying sympathy for a term, I asked. No, Manit snapped. He's telling you what I've told you twice already. You're a king-high idiot if you go through admissions this term. What? I asked. Why? Manit set his cards down with profound calm. Growth. You're a clever boy, but you have a world of trouble listening to things you don't want to hear. He looked left, then right at Willem and Simon. Can you try telling him? Take a term off, Willem said without looking up from his cards, then added, thick wet. You really have to, Sim said earnestly. Everyone's still talking about the trial. It's all anyone is talking about. <laughs> the trial? I laughed. That was more than a span ago. They're talking about how I was found completely innocent, exonerated in the eyes of the Iron Law and Merciful Talu himself. Manet snorted loudly, lowering his cards. <laughs> it would have been better if you'd been guilty in a quiet way, rather than be innocent so loud. He looked at me. Do you know how long it's been since an arcanist was brought up on charges of consultation? No, I admitted. Neither do I, he said which means it's been a long, long while. You're innocent, lovely for you, but the trial has given the university a great shining black eye. It's reminded folk that while you might not deserve burning, some arcanists might. He shook his head. You can be certain the masters are uniformly wet cap mad about that. Some students aren't too pleased either, Will added darkly. It isn't my fault there was a trial, I protested, then backed up a bit. Not entirely. Ambrose stirred this up. He was backstage during the whole thing, laughing up his sleeve. Even so, Will said, Ambrose is sensible enough to avoid admissions this time. What? I asked, surprised. He's not going through admissions? He is not, Willem said. He left for home two days ago. But there was nothing to connect him to the trial, I said. Why would he leave? Because the masters are not idiots, Manet said. The two of you have been snapping at each other like mad dogs since you first met. He tapped his lips thoughtfully, his expression full of exaggerated innocence. So that reminds me, whatever were you doing at the Golden Pony the night Ambrose's room caught fire? Playing cards, I said. Of course you were, Manet said, his tone thick with sarcasm. The two of you have been throwing rocks at each other for a full year, and one of them has finally hit the hornet's nest. The only sensible thing to do is run off to a safe distance and wait till the buzzing stops. 